basically this, as you know, is our panel about cyber security skills, headed can't get the staff. And just to give you a little bit of scene setting here, there's various bits of uh, information, some factoids that are out there if you do a search around the availability of cyber security skills. So for example, recent research from ISC Squared reckons that there's going to be a global shortfall of about 1.5 million security practitioners by 2020. So good news for those of you in the audience that are studying security or indeed those that are already working in the field and looking for work. A global study by Intel and the Centre for Strategic and International Studies reported that 82% of respondents to a survey that they conducted considered there to be a shortage of cyber security skills. 71% of those suggested that direct and measurable damage to organisations was occurring as a consequence of this. And as a final fact, the UK's National Audit Office believes that it could take up to 20 years to bridge the cyber uh, security skills gap that currently exists. So, an area of quite considerable demand. So, do we actually have a cyber security skills shortage? Some questions around that issue I think we should debate in the next 45 minutes or so. And to help me do it, because I don't know the answers, I've assembled a panel of people that I believe do. We'll go in a particular order. Go with Pete Fisher on the end there. Um, Pete is a fellow of the Institute of Information Security Professionals, the IISP. And notably for this panel, Pete's recently been involved in the revision of the IISP skills framework, which I hope many of you will have heard of. I'll go to the other end now, and you'll see why in a second. We've got Pete Woodward, uh, founder of the, or one of the founders of the Southwest Cyber Security Cluster, and also a holder of a, a variety of industry recognised post nominal letters, including CISSP, CHCCMP, CCDP, as well as being a PCI DSS qualified security assessor. Have I got that right, Pete? Right. And finally, Sort of breaking the, the tradition of being called Pete on the panel, we have Maria Papadaki, but we can call her Pete if it makes it easier for the, the rest of the audience. So Maria is the program manager of our BSc and MSc courses here in computer and information security, and she's also a CH instructor and a holder of the SANS GPEN certification, and a, a mentor in that context as well, if I remember rightly. So that's the panel. That's the role they're going to perform for us. So I'll start the ball rolling and ask a question. Then we'll, we'll basically throw it out to you. And if you don't have questions to ask, I'll just keep going until we finish. Um, so folks, do you reckon there really is a skill shortage? Is this real? And what does the supply and demand picture look like from your perspective? And I'll ask Pete that question. <laughs> right. Um, yes, we do have a skill shortage. Um, but we need to stand back and think, why do we have a skills shortage in cyber security? Because most of us uh, are spending our time and being paid well for it, um, trying to resolve problems that could have been avoided if other people had had a knowledge and understanding of security and the requirements. Uh, my old friend, uh, Professor Andy Blythe of the University of South Wales, uh, told me a few years ago, he said, we're teaching our students in the information security group, we're teaching our students how to earn a good living off the mistakes that their fellow students in the computer science area are going to make. Because the computer science department didn't cover cyber security in, in, in their agenda, what were in, their, in their degree programs. So if we can actually get to a stage where we get people out there who are developing software, and you heard from Ian Bryant this morning about the Trustworthy uh, Software Foundation, who are developing uh, software with a view to it being secure, who are designing systems and networks with a view to them being secure, who are um, uh, uh, operating and managing networks and systems with a view to being secure, then we would be in a, in a, in a position really to do the, the, the top of the, uh, the top level work. And uh, there may not, 
in, in the fullness of time be a shortage of cyber security professionals. But there is now because there's too much work out there for us to do. I'll, I'll add to that. Um, <clears throat> so in our perspective, it, it's worth understanding what is that skills shortage. And cyber security covers so many elements, you know, pen testing, you've got the non-technical uh, social engineering um, expertise. So it's, without thinking there's a, there's a gold rush going on at the moment, um, heading off, everyone's, everyone's turning to security experts. Um, so we're trying to quantify well. those skills. We're being hacked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All part of the DR process. Okay, so yeah, it's quantifying what those real skill gaps are and, and where we where we put those um, cyber security skills within organisations. And um, th there probably is a skill shortage, but I think as as a company owner, we have to understand what what we're lacking in cyber security skills. Um, on our perspective, we're looking at um, experienced consultants to be placed inside organisations to help them with their particular skill, uh, their particular um, skill set there, um, and also looking at the, 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 the new talent coming out of universities, etc., to, to nurture them and bring them up to speed with the, the real world and the areas we see as uh, threats. So it's pretty broad. Okay, uh, and if I can add as well, um, looking at uh, the need for cybersecurity professionals, there's estimation that within the next two years there's going to be 50% growth um, in uh, in the market um, for professionals. And essentially, what we're trying to do uh, at the university in terms of designing uh, the programs would be to have. Um, Com professionals with computing background, understanding of computing, so all the, you know, uh, software development um, mm -hmm. principles, uh, networks, uh, databases, uh, system analysis and design, and essentially appreciate that security needs to come into every single aspect. Um, so, uh, and on top of that, um, obviously, um, we need to have um, the skill set for um, technical aspects such as intrusion analysis, digital forensic investigation, uh, penetration testing, um, but uh, secure coding, as I said, um, but also human aspects of security and uh, essentially how legal aspects of security and how to bring everything together uh, through information security management, which is a pretty difficult um, thing actually to achieve within three years or four years. Um, but um, hopefully, uh, you know, by the time students uh, leave the university, they should be easy, it should be easy for them to um, utilize these skills and Event and grow gradually uh, into uh, more experienced security professionals. Okay, thank you. So, folks, does that prompt any initial questions or thoughts from the floor? Okay, we'll go there and then we'll go there. Uh, we've got a microphone that will come to you from what, right behind you, sir, in actual fact. Oh, gosh, thank you. <laughs> well, they sneak up on you, these people. Uh, yeah. uh, just following up on what Maria was saying, that he said that's a lot to achieve in three years. It's probably also a lot to achieve in one person. So do you, do you see cyber security as being several different people? So technical, business, people, people. Do you see that as a spread like a team? Um, well, I think it's important that um, a security professional in initially has this general background and then they could specialize in an area and delve a lot deeper uh, into a particular topic. So um, it is easy to get um, a programmer, for example, and then um, teach them how to do secure coding and then they, they could essentially be good in that role, but they will not understand the wider aspects of security. Um, so. From my perspective, it is good to start from a generic background uh, to, to get the basics in all of the different aspects uh, of the area to appreciate just how wide this area is and then eventually specialize in a topic. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, and Paul will come to you with a microphone. Sorry, Steve, can I, can I come in on, on, oh, on you that can. question? You can. Um, one of the concerns that I have with uh, the, the approach, I have a number of uh, concerns with the approach that we're taking to developing cyber security uh, professionals. And one of them is the point that you made, is 
you can't cram it all into one person. And whilst we need the, uh, uh, the deep technical, almost geeky um, cybersecurity professionals, we also need uh, a much broader set of skills in the cybersecurity profession. Uh, and one of the things that concerns me with that uh, with the image of cybersecurity as it currently is, is it focuses on the deep technical specialists. And uh, I am concerned that that is damaging the diversity of the profession as it goes forward, because it's not encouraging uh, people who could really make a contribution. Uh, when you think of, of the roles in cybersecurity, you, th you think of governance, um, you think of uh, awareness, training, and culture change. You think of uh, audit and compliance monitoring. And those are jobs that aren't uh, really attractive to the, the predominantly male uh, geeky te technologist. They could attract, and they should attract, more women into the profession because they can do that jo those jobs as well as, if not better than men. So uh, uh, I think there's an image thing there of, uh, uh, that, we need to, uh, that we need to address. Well, thank, you. Well, thank you for that, Pete. It is on? Oh, yes. Uh, um, that was going to be my question about audit and governance. But I'll throw it back to Maria and say, is that part of the curriculum at the university? Our audit and governance in building up a general knowledge base of uh, postgraduates? Um, so, uh, students in the first year, they're introduced, uh, so the first month when they enter university, they're introduced into different aspects of security. One of them will be information security management. Um, th and then in the final year, they will also be doing, uh, essentially they will be introduced to different standards and uh, approaches. Um, they will be looking at legal aspects of security as well. So I'm not going to say that uh, by the time they graduate they could be uh, information security managers and that they will be um, you know, fully fledged professionals, but I know graduates from here who within five years uh, they were. So essentially it provides the foundation and awareness of the, the knowledge base and the approach methodologies um, to be used so that eventually they will they will get there question over here there's a, uh, a bank I believe it's Barclays that runs the code playground which is aimed at teaching uh, coding to I think primary school age children um, how effective would gamification of security or introducing it at a primary school level be in terms of establishing it broadly before specialising in, in degrees and things like that? Uh, yeah, that's a um, good point. And, um, <coughs> we have a, a ten-year-old son myself who's well into his uh, coding and uh, not through force from a parent, obviously, but um, because he enjoys it and the interaction they get from that and the, uh, the, the problems they're solving by, by doing um, coding is a really good um, foundation for that. Um, I think it's a, a really good a good, you know, good way for, for knowledge transfer and certainly gets them into the, the ways of thinking around uh, maybe, you know, maybe security around coding. I mean, it's a bit early days for kids that age, but uh, moving forward, they'll have that mentality of, oh, this is how we build that program. And you know, they're embedding that security unbeknownst to them from the very start. So all thumbs up for those sort of things. Other Pete on the end? It's a good question because, yes, and the reason is, we need to learn from the criminals. I, I attended a session earlier this year by the National Crime Agency, and they were saying that the, uh, the, the, the criminal organizations who are recruiting people to develop their malware, what they're doing is they're putting games on the internet, and they're monitoring those to find out who out there is cracking into those games, manipulating the code so that they always win because those are the people with the mindset that they want to develop their, their malware code. Uh, and we should be doing the same thing to attract people in, because the National Crime Agency said, and it surprised me, that when, uh, when the criminals recruit their, their, their hackers in this way, the average annual payment is something like 15,000 a year. 
Now, I don't know what, uh, what Pete pays his pen testers, but I would guess it's a lot more than £15,000 a year. But the difference is that they, uh, they are drawn in and they're doing something that they love. It's a technical challenge, um, and, and they are being re recruited in that way, which is why the Barclays Bank uh, initiative, which is why the, uh, uh, the cybersecurity challenge is important because it is identifying those people who, uh, who have those skills. Pete in the middle? No? Okay. <laughs> so one thing I suppose I can add also from the perspective of what we do here at the university, in another life this marquee turns into a showcase area for, for basically secondary and primary school children to come in. And one of the things we do there to try and promote a security awareness and security mindset is get them acquainted with things like... Um, a password meter that actually lights up like a fairground thing, so testing their password strength, getting some very visual feedback, um, being exposed to biometric technologies in the context of something we've called the identity booth to get them aware of the different things that can be measured about their identity, and also playing around with basic things in terms of cryptography, so trying to appeal to different levels of, uh, of interest that they might have, but in all cases, amongst the other science and technology things, raising that bit of awareness on security here. So if I can add something, um, this is a sign uh, to me an indication that uh, programming is, um, is a skill that is a life skill and it will get developed a lot earlier nowadays and so um, essentially even security professionals need to get uh, used to the fact that there will be uh, highly skilled people um, who will be trying to crack um, uh, or to find vulnerabilities, crack the code, um, and they will be even against these people or working with these people, essentially. So um, the awareness uh, of um, um, even you know what we call the script kiddies, um, they are not just people who are using ready-made tools and they're just launching indis indiscriminate attacks. They are people who can actually code and they can create their own tools if needed. So um, yeah, the the skill set uh, of these people is going to be improved uh, in the next few years. Any further questions at this stage from the floor? A hand up over there. There was also a qu uh, Ian. Carry on. Hey. Um, thanks. I uh, just, I don't think you have an educational problem in this country with regards to cybersecurity curriculum. I look at the advanced work that the uh, Cyber Defense um, Challenge, the UK uh, Cyber Defense Challenge is doing. You're putting all the parts together really, really well. You have a people problem. The people problem is the fact that UK businesses at the small medium um, level of, are refusing to do sponsorship for visas to qualified candidates overseas. The process of getting a tier two visa to come over here is excruciating. I know this firsthand. And it's expensive. You need lawyers to make it work. So I don't think you, you actually have the problem that we think we have that we're solving at the educational level. You have a government policy problem and a access to your country for both the education and actually going and working uh, here. Fair point. Anyone on the panel want to respond to that? Or? No, we'll, we'll, steer, we'll steer clear of government policy there. <laughs> Oh, Pete, Pete uh, would like to speak. I was going to mention Brexit, but obviously there's a few things that need fixing in that, in that area, so, yeah. Okay, there was a hand over there. Paul, have you lost them? You've got them. Good. Uh, hi. With the, um, with the emergence of the um, Internet of Things becoming then the risk associated with that, do we think that's going to play any major part in the estimated job growth? Yes. <laughs> and in simple terms, yeah. So again, it's another skill that is going to be in demand. Um, you're going to have fridges, hacking, microwaves, and all sorts of things going on. So definitely um, a market watcher. Definitely uh, start you know, looking at the uh, Internet of Things. And also, um, John mentioned earlier about the critical national infrastructure. You know, look at the um, water providers, power providers, all these sort of things have Internet of Things and Internet connected devices that are going to need skill sets around um, that, that sort of area. So that, that's definitely going to be a growth area. Can I, can I come back to the, the point I made 
at the beginning, uh, I was uh, talking to, to one of our corporate members, Pentest Partners, earlier this year, and they were saying that they were ex absolutely appalled at the level of security in the products that they were testing under the Internet of Things. Uh, they, uh, they had a, a fairly well publicized um, uh, uh, item on, on the TV on, on uh, uh, a car that uh, uh, that um, wasn't uh, wasn't protected from uh, uh, from attack, and it wasn't protected from attack because the Wi-Fi was inadequately um, profiled, and they were saying it's something that the um, the IT manufacturers and the networking manufacturers have known for years, but because there's a new generation of engineers coming into the Internet of Things, they are not learning from the knowledge of their, their IT and networking uh, engineering uh, uh, equivalents elsewhere. So it is going to be a problem and there are going to be issues surrounding the Internet of Things. Got another question at the back here. Hello. Um, I have a question for you regarding, it's about getting staff. Well, we've already got staff. We've got staff that have got great skills as a is a really good compliment in this room of people who've got amazing skills and know the business. Um, how do we improve the skills of the staff to make sure that they keep current and as uh, technology changes and the codes change and the cryptography changes, how do we make sure they keep up to date because it's not just young people coming out of university with degrees, it's people who are already in the business who could meet that skills gap very much quicker. It's a very good question panel, do you have a good answer? <coughs> Sorry, we do it through um, continual professional education, so you get a qualification and there's a, an element of um, keeping up to, up to date with that and, and part of that is gaining CPE credits throughout the year to, to um, you know, attend shows, attend um, conferences, look at the new technologies coming into place, understanding those and, and sometimes passing exams as well at the end of the year. So it's a continual programme, if you like, of um, keeping up to date with, with those. So. For staffing levels that are really good and really skilled already, then you know you, I would encourage anyone to sort of put people on those sort of programmes and, and keep them up to date that, that way. That's from our point of view. Any other thoughts, Peter? Um, um, it's 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 a difficult situation to be in because you just can't put people on uh, training courses willy nilly if it's not relevant to their jobs. Um, uh, the best thing I think is, as, uh, as Pete has, uh, has indicated, is to try to encourage them to develop their skills and their knowledge personally through research, through attending conferences such as this, uh, and, and, and so on, to keep up to date that way, because they, uh, uh, they will then pick up ideas of where their, uh, their knowledge gaps are, and they will be able to come to you and say, I believe I've got a knowledge gap there, this is happening, I've read about it or I've heard about it, and I think I need some training in that area. Um, and also, um, bodies like uh, Institute of Information Security Professionals or events, uh, magazines, um, all of these uh, aspects will help to build a network of contacts and um, and, and knowledge essentially so that um, you can get support um, and advice uh, when needed. Okay, I'm going to up, go on and you can have a go and then I'll ask another question. No, no, we'll get the microphone. There we are. Keep Paul busy. Um, it's not really a question, but it's a sort of extension of what you guys are saying, I think. It might be turned into a question, but and I don't know whether it's a true example or not, it doesn't really matter, but Chubb who obviously were a brilliant, ah, oh, a brilliant locksmith, and make mechanical locks. Was it was it not true that in in response to the market they had to move into um, swipe cards and and that market and magnetic locks controlled by computer systems and immediately their locks started to get broken because their their IT skills weren't good enough. Now it's a completely different skill set, isn't it? One, one, one's a mechanical and one's electrical and computer and everything. It is, and, and, and that's the point about the Internet of Things, is that people who are um, 
not necessarily skilled or knowledgeable in in cybersecurity issues are being drawn into the uh, drawn into the field and they don't have the knowledge and background and skills in order to do it properly okay so i've got another question for you then panel so what should organizations be looking for in terms of getting their security expertise what are the hallmarks of a security professional and indeed what do skills look like in the security context Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, fr from my perspective, running a consultancy business, it's all about customer facing. So we want the um, the knowledge will be there. Obviously, um, we, we want to build that. Um, we want somebody who would be knowledgeable in their field, um, customer facing, client facing, skilled, multiple skilled, um, skilled in doing the work that, that we require them to do. Obviously. Um, but a general, all-round, nice person, really. And uh, you know, I think the we look beyond experience. Um, we're not necessarily not necessarily want to employ people with experience. That'd be great. But we really encourage um, applicants uh, to join our business um, to be actually really um, enthusiastic, knowledgeable about their their um, skill set, and wanting to learn more, and just be really dynamic and able to grow. Really. Thank you. Just adding to that, uh, um, I think enthusiasm and, and uh, pers personableness, if, if, if that's the correct word, is important. You, you want people who will, uh, uh, will come in, will, will be self-motivated, will be enthusiastic, uh, and will get on with their colleagues. Um, there, is a, there is a subset to that, uh, and I'll, I'll use an anecdote. Um, a colleague of mine, way back, was uh, the uh, uh, head of cryptography and mathematics at GCHQ. And he said to me, he said, uh, I've just recruited a new graduate. He said, I've spoken to his professor, and he said, uh, he said to me, he said, Richard was very, very difficult to get to work within the degree program because he was always off doing some innovative research and some, uh, 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 some challenging work on developing mathematical theories. And he's just the person we want. And I thought, Richard, you've just, you know, you, you've just employed a guy who won't do what you tell him to do. But looking back, he was right and I was wrong because the job that he wanted that guy to do needed someone with enthusiasm, someone who could think out of the box, someone who was innovative, and someone who would meet a challenge. And he got the person that he wanted, and he, he actually turned out to be very successful. So uh, um, it's, you know, we need to make sure that it's not just one profession. We're looking for people in different roles, and they will be, uh, uh, you will be looking for different things in them. Um, reflecting on the feedback that we got last year from the industry um, uh, liaison panel, um, the feedback that we got was very similar actually, um, in the sense that um, yes, they, they do want uh, graduates with computing background and the technical knowledge, uh, but they also want them to have the people skills and um, communication skills to be able to discuss their work and uh, to also have the initiative um, to set targets and to progress through the years. Um, so yeah, I think it is um, not just the technical skills but also uh, people skills and softer skills as well that will prove very uh, useful um, along the years. Um, in terms of the technical skills, we, you know, we can use the benchmark uh, skills from uh, ISP and uh, CISP and so on, but uh, I think it's a, a variety of skills that are important. So, Peter, I'm going to target you at the end there, just to see if there's anything you can add on that IISP skills framework aspect particularly. Um, not really. One, one or two little things in the, the, um, uh, the uh, I think, 
the skills framework was set up in 2006. And in terms of the work that I did, well, I just documented it. It was everybody else's work because I consulted widely. And um, not a lot of changes. Uh, uh, the main changes were uh, around the rise of penetration testing as a skill in, in, in the past 10 years. Um, also, the, the business view of assurance uh, included audit, compliance testing, and penetration testing, uh, which wasn't picked up 10 years ago. Um, we've been running uh, a pilot of, uh, of the new skills framework for membership purposes, and I'm also working with the College of Policing on using it uh, for, uh, for their purposes. And one of the things that uh, the College of Policing are very, very keen on is that in the soft skills there must be a very strong sec section on, on ethics because in the computer security world people could go bad ethics is very very important okay. opportunity for questions from the floor again Bob? I think I'd like to hold on let's wait for the microphone so you come up on the recording sir <laughs> I think I'd like to be a bit uh, if I may, uh, and throw to the panel a sort of curved ball. I think uh, what you're talking about today as being key skills for cyber security have always been key skills in engineering disciplines. I think the fundamentals is if you get the training program correct in educational academia and follow those through into industry and have the management who have the prowess and capability to implement those and make sure their staff adhere to it without being overly disciplinarian, we will find those engineering disciplines pervading through all the areas of engineering design, including security. Because when I started off in the computer business, security was fundamental. And for example, channel separation in networks. How many people are taught that today? of the A and B channel and the crossover. How do you make your channel separation resilient to attack? And in the 70s particularly, uh, we were very rigorous on infrastructure security. Today we're pretty lax. So do you think there is really a skill shortage or do you really believe it's a training program shortage throughout the supply chain? looking pensive now look. <laughs> yeah, you said grilling earlier so yeah <laughs> uh, yeah very good question and absolutely totally agree with you that engineering process spreading out and, and actually covering um, security and sites particularly cyber security um, I think is a, a bit of everything needs to happen there and whether technology moving at the pace it is right now and, and where it's going in the future maybe that's one of the common denominators that's actually slowing down this proper implementation in some areas maybe, I don't know, but um, you've got to look at the, the speed and growth of technology in all areas uh, as a key element that it, letting the standard slip possibly in that sense. Okay. I think there is a skill shortage because the world that you describe is no longer. Talking to organisations like the BCS, they are saying we need to spend much more time uh, making sure that our, our, um, our certified IT professionals have a knowledge of security in terms of their work as IT professionals. I'm talking to the IET and they're saying the same, that uh, uh, they need a they've got an internal training initiative within the IET to actually provide cyber security basic fundamental knowledge to engineers who are coming to them saying I feel I've got a need for this can you provide me with some direction and training because because it's because it's gone so uh, um, and it needs it, it actually needs to spread wider than just the few of us who say oh we are cyber security professionals we're information security professionals we concentrate on this security stuff 
it needs to permeate out into, into, into the engineering and software development discipline. Um, so in sort of in the um, computing world, what we have seen is that um, progress has essentially uh, driven um, uh, software development um, and so looking at the practices over the years we used to have um, uh, initially ad hoc development teams keep, uh, keeping their own libraries so then eventually building uh, larger projects but there wasn't really uh, all that there wasn't very rigorous approach and even now we can uh, discover vulnerabilities in open source software that they have been around for years and nobody uh, sort of had realized it before. So the problem is that um, uh, the, these practices have not been adopted over the years and essentially security was almost an afterthought. Even when you look at the network, sorry, the, the networking protocols, uh, a lot of um, modifications have had to be introduced over the years to make them more secure. Um, and so the concept of where vulnerabilities could um, uh, exist, uh, we already know and we can teach our students, but we are probably teaching our students uh, 30 years after, <laughs> later, than uh, we should have done. Um, and so uh, back in the 80s, 90s, uh, up to 2000, I would say, security was an afterthought and um, the drive was to provide more features, more functionality rather than make software secure. And yeah, we, we are essentially, uh, even now, uh, having to deal with software that uh, has been developed with our mentality. Okay. I think there's a question at the back. Um, you've been talking about the generic knowledge everybody should have and the people's skills. And I would like to ask, what's the difference between the ISP framework you've developed and the SOFIA framework? Because in the other day, of the day, we all come from a computing background. We all need the same communication skills, team working skills, security skills. So why are the professional bodies that don't team up as SOFIA tried to do and have this framework that was globalized and you have something? Is it really different to the SOFIA framework or how would you compare the two? Over to you, Pete. <laughs> That's one, definitely one from me, and it's a very good question. Uh, I don't know why the two uh, have grown up separately. Uh, Sophia was led by BCS. Um, uh, the ISP uh, in 2006 set up its, its skills framework. It set it up talking to um, its, uh, its corporate members. And it's very, the, the difference really between them uh, because, because I've looked at them, them both in terms of the skills framework. Um, the SOFIA framework, uh, Skills for the Information Age, is really talking about going up the management and responsibility chain. Um, so that so level six and level seven in, in SOFIA are your uh, your directors, your top managers, the people who are overseeing, setting strategy, setting direction. Where the, um, uh, the ISP skills framework comes in is that what we're talking about there uh, is developing the technical skills, with the, the technical level within each skill. So uh, in terms of, for example, penetration testing, which is uh, skill D3, shows what a sad person I am. Uh, penetration testing, level six in penetration testing is not someone who manages uh, an operation, manages a team of, uh, uh, of penetration testers. It is someone who is a subject matter expert who is referred to by the organization when a new challenge comes along or where there's a difficult problem. So the two aren't exactly the same and, and uh, uh, <coughs> we did try and, um, and map them across, but they, they don't really quite map across. Um, because one is, is, is purely in developing the skill, and the other is, is growing, I think, as, as, as a, uh, uh, a manager and a leader and a director within the organization. Thank you. Question over here again? One of our graduates. 
So just as a kind of fun hypothetical, if you were trying to address the cybersecurity skills shortage, would you hire a former black hat like Kevin Mitnick and why? Or why not? Obviously. <coughs> Uh, yeah, so they, they, black hat, obviously, white hat, grey hat, uh, determines levels of pen testing, and uh, black hats are obviously slightly on the uh, wrong side of the law most of the time. Um, so it's sometimes perceived that their skills are really important, really sought after, but they're fully obtainable by uh, legal methods and actually doing proper training and understanding around, around hacking and penetration techniques. So. Personally, I wouldn't employ a black hat. Um, there's, there's obviously, it comes with a moral um, attachment to that. Um, we're trying to do everything uh, right and make companies safe and doing all the, the good things to prevent attacks. So, what, you know, I wouldn't want to, personally, wouldn't want to go and employ an ex hacker. Um, go out for a drink and learn the skills and <laughs> understand that way. But obviously, the, the, one of the main things is to, to, to prevent attacks and try and uh, ward off attacks in itself is to, to learn um, ethically how to, to prevent those attacks and uh, you have to have an element of understanding the, the penetration methods to actually defend against those. So the, the, it's a bit of a um, question to ask a question and um, I'm obviously sitting on the fence on that one really but uh, that, that's my answer. I can but agree. Um, certainly back in the 90s there was a spate of um, uh, American security firms hiring black hats uh, and most of it to my memory ended in tears um, because they didn't have the, tr the trust and the ethics background uh, to operate in commerce they, uh, uh, they reverted to type although the skill sets were identical. So Maria We've interviewed Kevin Mitnick. Would you hire him? <laughs> um, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I mean, Kevin Mitnick is uh, not a hacker anymore, and so he is a consultant. And I think now he can f speak freely, actually, um, about techniques and so on. Whereas when we interviewed him, he wasn't exactly at liberty to speak. Um, but um, yeah, um, uh, it's actually a common pattern um, where um, perhaps um, people think that um, they can discover vulnerabilities, they can present them to a company and say, oh, look, I have discovered this vulnerability, now hire me as a consultant to fix them for you. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's not necessarily the right way to go about it, and we definitely wouldn't recommend this to any of our students um, to do this. So it is important that, uh, you know, when it comes to security profession that um, you have the, the, the professionals can operate within that um, with ethics um, in mind. Just, just because you wouldn't employ him doesn't mean you can't learn from him. And uh, I, I'm assuming you've read The Art of Deception um, and uh, you know, we can learn a lot and we should be learning a lot from the way that, uh, that the, uh, uh, the criminals and the bad guys operate so that we can defend properly. Okay, folks, we've got about five minutes or so left. Time for more questions from the floor, or I can fire a final one at them. Yes. Wait for the microphone, which is just about reaching. There we go. Thank you. Um, primarily, cybersecurity is being promoted by the MOD, government, and um, public sector. Is there any indication, when we're looking at partnership and third-party contracts, uh, the same interest, money and time is being spent in the commercial sector where we can have some assurance that what are, people are coming to us for contracts are knowledgeable in the same sphere. Can I start with that one? Um, there is an increasing drive from the commercial sector uh, towards um, good security and good security practice. Um, we, you know, we tend to paint, paint a black picture, but things are improving. Um, you still get, um, uh, there was an advert earlier this year 
for uh, a Chief Information Security Officer uh, uh, who uh, would be working to uh, the, head, the, the head security architect of the firm. It doesn't compute. Your CSO, CISO has got to be at or near board level. It's got to be seen as an equal. Uh, but but things, things are improving and um, organizations are getting more and more concerned about the, the, the security risks. Uh, talking to one of the CISOs at BP, uh, he was saying that uh, he'd been given a challenge by his directors to do a, um, a threat and risk assessment of uh, driverless oil tankers because they were, uh, uh, they were thinking of introducing, you know, at some stage in the future, driverless oil tankers delivering to, oil, to, to, to fuel stations. So there, there, there are, are challenges out there and the boards are starting to recognize those challenges and, uh, and consulting, in, certainly internally, their cybersecurity professionals. Anyone else want to come in on that one? Yeah, just, just like to pee, I think um, you know, industry is picking up. Um, and if you look at the National Cyber Security Centre that, that's recently launched, um, I made a note of the four um, key, key objectives. And number one is understand the cyber security environment and share that knowledge. So it's a, sort of an idea on where we are right now. So there's still a lot of um, knowledge sharing and, and upskilling and, and getting to a point where you know th there is a lot more interaction going on, I think, so it's still a little way off, I think. Any final questions from the floor? Last chance, last opportunity. Ah, there's one right there. The microphone right over your shoulder. Um, I just wonder, uh, I'll draw a conversation that I've had with my children, as I know most of you have, uh, can, can connect with. Is I, when I first got into this trade, I was, uh, had difficulty describing what I did to people that weren't already doing it. And I think some of the element is skills. We need to have a good, clear framework and a career path. But also it's about how we pitch ourselves to these new people coming in, going through school. Because if we say to our children, for example, in my case, in the early days, and they say, what do you actually do when you go to work? You leave the house with a bag, with a laptop, and then you come back with a bag and a laptop and some days you look happy and some days you look like you've got despair on your face. And this was an eight-year-old. <laughs> um, and it was really difficult to describe that actually what I did was, was found problems at work and asked people to fix them or take ownership for them. That's one pitch I used. Another one was oh, I'd go to the board and tell them about all these problems that they've got and they had to decide whether to do anything or not. And that, that really, you could see on their face that that was really, looked like a really rubbish job. But thank you, Daddy, for going off and doing it. <clears throat> Whereas if you look at the other career paths, so developers, for example, or going into software design, you're going out to create new stuff that does wonderful new things. Whereas if you look at the current pitch of a security professional, it's finding all the problems and pointing them out to people that have already done all the new stuff. So I think an element of learning from this is probably maybe from the marketing world or from talking to people who are early on in these career decisions to say, well, what makes you want to go down this route and not this one? Because I think there's a danger that our career path could be seen and to link to the Pixar film Wally is actually we're the people that just clear up the mess all the time, whereas in fact we should be the people that design the good stuff in from the outset and create the demand at the exec levels to say, I don't want to buy this bad app, and to link to John's uh, presentation earlier, I'm not going to buy from that web company because you're not giving me all the right signs. And that way we, can, we, we, we are going to be clearing up a lot of mess for a good few years by the sound of it, at least maybe another 30. But also, we need to be driving the demand from the execs and from the people coming through to schools that this is an interesting, leading-edge, exciting career path to get into. Okay, so let's use this as a final question. I mean, I've often had the question posed to me, what do you actually do? But setting that aside, folks on the panel, quick answer from each of you. How would you pitch security and why people should enter that as a profession? We await your views. <laughs> <laughs>
come back after coffee. Yeah, well, <laughs> maybe. We may need to. <laughs> I wish you'd given me warning of that one, Steve. <laughs> Um, it was improvised based on the comment from the floor. <laughs> a will, a will, a will. I've been in this business for what? Over 30 years. And it was probably the best career move I ever made coming into it. Because every day is different. You face different challenges. Uh, all right, there are bad days when, uh, when you don't get your own way. Uh, but there are good days when you make, when you have wins, and it really does lift you. And uh, and I think it's true of everyone who's come into this profession that they stay because there's lots of different challenges. You meet uh, and work with lots of really interesting people, lots of really nice people, uh, and it's a, it's it's a good business to be in. Okay, one down, two to go. I'll go next. Um, yeah, I, I think we get enormous satisfaction from uh, helping organisations of all sizes protect themselves or make themselves a lot more secure in the, in the, the world today. Um, and also you get to kill the bad guys, so it's good stuff. Not really kill, obviously. <laughs> um, there's also a lot of uh, analysis and investigation going on, so you can say that you have to look for clues and um, find out, uh, well, uh, be able to uh, put all the pieces of the puzzle in order to get a complete picture of what might have happened. And so, yeah, I would say mainly uh, um, you can be the investigator for one day and then you can be the policeman for the next and then you can be <laughs> uh, the creator another day. So you can uh, use a wide set of skills, essentially. I was convinced you were going to just say, I agree with Pete. Uh, okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's thank the panel very much for their efforts.